Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be up here before you this morning. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you. I thank you for, <clears throat> for this morning, for uh, being with all those gathered here. Lord, I pray that the words I speak will be your words, that you would speak through me and let your words settle on the hearts of all those who hear it this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I've got the honor of introducing our theme for today, and our theme is called this Discipleship Growth, with emphasis on the, the second word there, the, the growth portion. Um, I used to think that being a Christian, this whole thing with, with Christianity was all about getting to the point of salvation, the point of saying yes, yes, Jesus, I believe, I'm, I'm a sinner, I need you in my heart, um, and, I, and I'm saved now, and then that's the whole point, and that's it. And then I guess the rest of life is just kind of coasting. Um, I, I came to kind of kind of come to the other understanding that that's just the first step. That what God wants of, of us is is growth. Once we get to that that salvation part, that saying yes, okay, next step, next step, next step. And so we're really called to grow. Um, it, it is a journey, and it reminds me of. You know, we just, we just went through the season of graduations. Maybe you went to a graduation, and if you did, you probably heard something along the lines of um, commencement is not an end, it's a beginning. You know, that's what commencement means. It's a beginning. So, uh, you know, we're graduating, but we're going on, and, and there's more to it, right? So it's the same kind of thing. It's, it's what we told our, our confirmands, the four confirmands that, that um, just went through that nine-month process, they weren't getting to an end of the process on, on that day of Pentecost and that day of being confirmed and saying, okay, you've graduated now, and, and, and you're part of the church now, and that's, that's the end. You know, that nine-month process was preparing them to answer the question of what, what do you believe, and they all said, yes, I believe. Okay, now what? Now the journey begins. So it's really a beginning, a beginning of that process. And I think back to our, our men's retreat last year. We called it faith under construction. So it's the, whole, the same idea, the same idea that we're... We're always under construction. God's always working on us and calling us to take that next, that next step, that next step, no matter what our age or how long we've um, been involved in the church or uh, how long we've, you know, how long it's been since we said yes to that call. Um, it's, it's a process. Uh, we're always growing. So this isn't just me saying that. Let, let's look at what Scripture says about the whole process of growth. So we've got Paul talking to the uh, the church in Philippi, and he says. And so I'm sure that God, who began this good work in you, will carry it on until it's finished on the day of Christ Jesus. So beginning that good work in you and then carrying it on. He didn't stop there. Um, and the next scripture, also from Paul in Colossians. Um, so ever since we first heard about you, we've kept on praying. Keep in mind, this is Paul talking to an early church. So the, he's just planting the seeds in the, in the church here in Colossus, and now he's, he's encouraging them. Um, we've kept on praying and asking God to help you understand what he wants you to do, asking him to make you wise about spiritual things and asking that the way you live will always please the Lord and honor him so that you will always be doing good, kind things for others while all the time you're learning to know God better and better. We're praying too that you will be filled with his mighty glorious strength so that you can keep going no matter what happens, always full of the joy of the Lord. And then the next scripture, also from Colossians. And now, just as you trusted Christ to save you, trust him too for each day's problems. So it's that same idea of, okay, initially you, you've trusted Christ, you've given your life to Christ. Trust him too for each day, each day's problems. Live in vital union with him. Let your roots grow down into him and draw up nourishment from him. I love that line right there. Let your roots grow down into him and draw up nourishment from him. That, that imagery of, of growth, that seedling that grows. See that you go on growing in the Lord and become strong and vigorous in the truth you were taught. Let your lives overflow with joy and thanksgiving for all he has done. So if we've established that, that that's what God wants of us. He wants us to keep growing. The question is how. And the good news is that we have a, a blueprint. We have a blueprint uh, that, that God gives us for how to grow. And it's a three-step process. Um, and I like that it's, a, it's a, an easy process. This is not difficult. So the first step, love God. The greatest commandment of all, love God. Now that's a process too. It's not, um, you know, it's not just a simple checkbox that we can check off to love God, move on to the next step. 
it's a process where we, it's, it's a lifelong process where we have to keep growing. It's that initial prayer that we pray to take Jesus into our heart and then keep growing in our love of God. Step two, the second greatest commandment, love others, love your neighbor. So we start with our, you know, our immediate circle, our family, our friends, our church family, and then it keeps growing and growing. And it's not just the ones that we like, it's the ones that are hard to love. Okay, so that lifelong process of learning to love our neighbor. And then step three, go out and serve the world. Make disciples of all nations. Uh, taking what we've internalized with our love of God and our love of neighbor and spreading it out to make disciples of all nations. So this is, this is the three-step process for how we grow. But again, these aren't just simple check boxes. We can't just say, okay, I've done number one, I'm going to go on number two, and I'm done that one. We have to grow within each of those because if we look a little deeper in what the commandments are, it's not just love God. It's love God with all our hearts, all our minds, all our souls, all our strength. That's, that's tough. That's, uh, I mean, that takes work. That's, that's a lifelong process. And then love your neighbor. It's not just love your neighbor. It's love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And not just any neighbor. It's, like I said, it's the ones that are really hard to love. You know, it's uh, Christians loving Muslims, Republicans loving Democrats, Ravens fans loving Steelers fans. Right, Beata? <laughs> Beata and I spent about, what, 30 hours or so in the car over the week of the mission trip. Um, she's a, a rabid, rabid Steelers fan. I'm not. <laughs> but we loved our neighbor, right? Um, lastly, go, go and make disciples... But don't just go and make disciples. Don't just go out and serve the world. Go and make disciples of all nations, okay? So within each of these three steps, there are very high goals, things that we have to strive for that, that God puts in front of us, and that takes lifelong commitment. So the question is, what, what does Epworth do for us? How, do, how does Epworth help us along this journey? Uh, well, let's look at the first step, growing in our love of God. Worship, what you're doing right now. Um, coming here, being introduced to, to God and how we can love him. Um, learning. Uh, th this, is, this is one of the, you know, the, the greatest vehicles that we have for taking that first step in loving God. Um, special services at Upworth. You know, Lent, Christmas, Easter, because there's different ways that we, that we worship, whether it's the kind of introspective time of Lent where we're looking inward or the celebration that comes with Easter. Um, those, those are ways that help us get to know God in, in a different way. Uh, the music, choir, handbells, the cantatas, the special music. Um, a lot of people um, feel connected to God through music. And then Sunday school. Not just children's Sunday school, but youth and adult. Because again, um, it, it's not just something that happens as a, as a child or as a young person. It's a lifelong process, so we've got the adult Sunday school too that, that Arun mentioned. Um, so those, those are ways that Epworth can help us with that step number one, that, that connecting with God and loving God. How about the second step, growing in our love of others? Um, well, we've got a lot of small groups. We've got our Thursday night Bible studies, men's breakfast. Um, meets twice a month, and it's a great way for the men to connect and grow in community with each other. Uh, the AMPT ministry for the youth, the young adult gatherings, the E3 outings. Um, Joys and concerns, what we're going to have here in a few minutes, the time where we can connect with each other and celebrate with each other and mourn with each other and laugh and cry with each other and, and grow in our church family. And then coffee hour. We're going to be hosting a coffee hour after worship, and that's the time, too, where we can connect in our love of others. Okay, how does Epworth help <clears throat> with our, that step three, that uh, service portion of serving others? Well, we've got the mission trip, which we're going to hear more about. Um, Born Mechanic Christian Work Camp, which Bill talked about. We've got Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes, which we do every year, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with those. The Goodwill Thanksgiving dinner downtown. Kennedy Krieger Festival of Trees, uh, serving at the Thrifty Penny. Um, special projects like collecting bikes for Bikes for the World or luggage for foster care kids. So a lot of opportunities at Upworth to engage in that service uh, piece, that step number three. So today you're going to hear from three men, each talking about one of those three steps and putting their spin on it. And I would just encourage you to, to listen to each of them and to think about where you are on your journey and what, uh, what step you can take. And I, I think my, my biggest recommendation would just be to pray. Pray about where you are, what step you can take, big steps, small steps, whatever, whether it's through Upworth or 
outside the walls of Epworth? Um, what can you do just to take that next step on your own personal journey? All right, so I have the privilege to talk to you guys a little about loving God. Um, I've met most of you here. Uh, some are unfamiliar faces, but I've been coming here for about four years now. Um, and my journey's been a little bit different than uh, most people here. Uh, I grew up in a Jewish family. Um, I went to temple every weekend. I knew God, but I don't know that I really loved God. Um, I went through my bar mitzvah. Actually, the cantor and the rabbi were really, really worried about me. They didn't think I was going to do a good job because I wasn't putting in a lot of effort. Um, they gave me like a CD to play and work with uh, how to say things because I had to speak another language in order to do that. I had to be able to read Hebrew and speak Hebrew. Um, and I still remember some things, and I have no idea what they mean. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, all week, I listened to that CD, and I memorized it. So I got up in front of the entire congregation. I read from the Bible, and then it was over. And I was like, oh, good job, good job. You did awesome. I'm like, I, I don't know what I said. <laughs> um, so it was something that I felt I had to do, and something that I was told I was expected to do. Um, and it took a while for me to come back to God after I had my bar mitzvah because I didn't love God. Um, and it didn't come until about four and a half, five years ago um, that I even thought about God again. Um, I came up with my own beliefs. I, you know, I like to say I think logically and I came up with what made sense in my head, so that must be true. Um, but about Five years ago, someone asked me uh, if they would be willing to read the, if I would be really willing to read the Bible, um, because they couldn't date someone that wasn't a Christian. Um, so it, it, I was like, sure, why not? What could go wrong? Um, so I, I, they gave me uh, one of the message Bibles, so it was directed a little bit more towards someone who didn't have a deep understanding of what was going on, which was great. Um, but also a little bit tricky because I was really good at twisting the words of the Bible. I was, you know, love thy neighbor. Oh, hey, you should go out with me. It says love your neighbor. It's, it's all good. Um, and I really just, I didn't, I didn't see the whole story. I just went with what I saw. Um, and after a while, got to the point where, um, obviously I'm talking about Kelsey, <laughs> um, got to the point where she was saying, you know what, I I can't do this. I'm choosing you over God. And that took a lot of love of God from her. And without that love that she had for God, I probably wouldn't be here. Um, we had a nice three-hour conversation in car right outside my apartment. Um, just we both, we loved each other. We, we respected each other, but she couldn't do that. I was pulling her away from God. And it completely threw me off. Um, it was something that we'd had conversations about before, but it really, it didn't click. So what I did was I tried to figure out what was going on. I actually um, stopped coming here because you guys had seen me at that point. I went to Grace for a couple weeks, and I tried to figure out what is so great that she would choose this over what we had together. Um, and while I was there, um, they were playing a song, Holy Spirit, and I closed my eyes, and I was praying, and I, I could have sworn. I was sitting there. Jesus, I saw him come sit next to me and said, Corey, come follow me. And that's where I started. That's where I started thinking, hey, maybe there's something to this. I had this overwhelming feeling just crash over me. I felt comfortable. I felt safe. I felt loved. Um, and that led to, you know, many nights of like five-hour conversations with Kelsey. We would go and sit and have coffee. Um, and it got to the point where um, we were having conversation, and she was saying, you know, you, you can't 
love me just to love God. It's got to be the other way around. And she drew this picture. Um, Barry, if you could go to the picture that I sent you. Where um, we, had, we had math because I was in math terms. Uh, that's the way my brain works. Where I am A and she is C and God is B. So in math terms, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Well, in this case, we replace all of the equal signs with love. If I love God and she loves God, then I can love her, but God is still in the middle. So that B has to be in the middle. We couldn't be where we are today without me loving God. And I remember sitting there, I can't remember if it was that time or if it was one of the times after that where I said it for the first time out loud. I love God. And I just had this rush, that same rush that I felt the first time that I saw Jesus. Just wash over me this overwhelming sense of this is good. This is where I need to be. Um, and that was a huge thing for me. Um, and it may be something where you're in the same situation. You've come to church time and time again, but you've never said it out loud. You've never said, I love God. And that's okay, because it's a process. And Matt said that before. It's not, it didn't stop the moment I said, I love God. It, it took a while for me to act like I loved God. You know, uh, you guys know me as the person that comes to church, and before that, I was not the same person that I am now. Um, I did things that I shouldn't have, and I learned from those mistakes. Um, but... Through our talks, there are a couple of things um, that me and Kelsey talked about. One of the things was 1 John 4, uh, 19. It says, we love because he first loved us. And I'm not sure if this is in the Bible, and I meant to ask Bill about this. And me and Kelsey had a conversation, but we couldn't find it. She twisted it into saying, in order uh, to love, we have to first know God. Because God teaches us how to love. I think her words were, we know how to love only once we know how to love God. I didn't know how to love God because I didn't know God. And through her help and the help of this congregation, I learned how to love God. I still remember I've been coming here for a couple weeks and Bill comes up to me and said, hey, how would you like to go to Ocean City to a youth co uh, convention? I'm like, all right, sure. And that was probably one of the best experiences I had. Whole, like, 4,000 people sitting, praising God. I could feel the love. When you feel that love, you feel that connection, and it's the greatest thing that there is. Um, the last scripture that I have um, is actually something came up this week, or last week. Uh, in our apartment, we have a board where we write a verse of the week, and I thought it fit perfectly in with what I was talking about. It's Jeremiah 29, 13, and it says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. At first, I wasn't seeking with all my heart. I was just going surface level. I was just taking the words that I saw and twisting them to what I wanted them to say. Once I sought God with my full heart, he was there waiting with open arms, and he will do the same for the rest of you and for those to come. So I thought that would be, a, just happened to fall into place. It, again, there's God. So loving God is an easy thing, but first you have to seek him out. And um, we get a chance now to show our love for God with uh, serving communion, which I think Bill is going to talk about. And now I'd like to invite John Turner. Thank you, Bill, and good morning, everyone. I have the uh, second step uh, to talk about in our faith journey, uh, to love others. And when you look at the scriptures in the Bible, there are many references about loving others. Of course, the, the golden rule may come to mind first. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. But we also find in Matthew 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And it goes on, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In John, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And I will say from listening to Corey that uh, Corey Kelsey is right. This next uh, reading is from the Bible, <laughs> which says, Let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. In Philippians, it reads, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. In James, we get to the heart of the matter in my point today. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith, therefore, without deeds is like saying you love others, but without taking any action to demonstrate that love outwardly. The Apostle Paul wrote that followers of Christ have a treasure inside of them that is to be shared with the world. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. The treasure inside us is the message of Christ and his love. This treasure is not to be hidden, but is to be shared so that by God's love and grace, people of every nation can be welcomed into his family. Some of you may have heard the story about the Japanese soldier stationed in the Philippines during World War II who didn't hear that the war had ended in 1945. It was almost 30 years later in March of 1974 that his former commanding officer traveled from Japan to the Philippines and gave him the official order to stand down for which the soldier finally found out Japan had surrendered and the war was over. The same thing may be happening with many of our friends, family, or strangers around us who haven't heard from anyone else about Jesus Christ and what he can do for their lives. Let's not let this happen to the people we come into contact with when it comes to letting them know the good news of Jesus Christ. Remember that our, there are some like the Japanese soldier, still waiting to hear the news and may not hear it unless you tell or show it to them by your actions. Recently, the TV channel Netflix presented the series uh, entitled The Crown, which followed the beginning of the reign of the current Queen Elizabeth II of Great Britain. Maybe many of you have watched that. The Prime Minister at the time, Winston Churchill, is prominently featured in the beginning of the series. One episode in particular focuses on the painting of his portrait by a modern artist of the time named Graham Sutherland. This was to be Churchill's 80th, was to be for his 80th birthday and to be the official portrait that would then hang in Parliament. Once it was finished and revealed to Churchill, however, he was terribly upset by it and agitated because it showed him in an unflattering light, probably a little meaner, a little arrogant, maybe a little bit heavier than he uh, thought that he should have been uh, portrayed. As a matter of fact, he was so disgusted with how he was depicted in that picture that he hid the portrait and eventually it was burned to ashes never to be seen again. Now something, simple, now something similar 
may be happening in what our actions and pictures say about how we show our love to others. How would our painted portrait depict us? Would our love for others show through in our portrait? The Apostle Paul stated, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus with a desire to accurately represent our Lord. He urged his followers to reflect the humility, self-sacrifice, and compassion of Jesus for others. Remember that we may be the only Jesus some people will ever see through us. So as we in humility value others above ourselves, will we show the world the heart and attitude of Jesus himself by the actions we take to demonstrate his love to the others around us? As we mentioned in the beginning, Paul proclaimed, we have a treasure inside us that is to be shared with the world. In closing, may we, through Jesus Christ, share the treasure with someone today. The good news of Jesus is too wonderful to keep to ourselves. May we live the gospel and share it with others throughout our journey with you, O Lord. Amen. I have about 40 pages here, but I promise we'll get out before two. <laughs> missionaries, why do we send missionaries to other lands? Why do Christian churches send missionaries to other lands when they already have their own religions and when there are so many people who still need to be reached in this country? There are three main reasons why we should support foreign missions. First, is simply that Christ commanded it. The Great Commission, which he gave to his disciples, explicitly commands, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, verse 15. He also said, ye shall be a witness unto both Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the utmost parts of the earth, Acts 1.8. Whether we understand the full reason for the commission or not, or whether we agree with it or not, is therefore beside the point. Since the Lord Jesus commanded it, true Christians must and will try to follow it, either by going themselves or by supporting those who go. If a man loves me, he will keep my words, Jesus said, John 14, verse 23. The second reason for foreign missions is that all men desperately need to know the way of salvation. The Bible is exceedingly clear in emphasis that all men are sinful and rebellious against God and therefore are lost and are need to be saved. Therefore, all men urgently need to learn how to be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe him whom they have not heard of? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And who shall preach except those that are sent? Romans 10, 13 through 15. The third reason for foreign missions is that only Jesus Christ can meet that need and each man has for salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14 through 6. Jesus is uniquely the eternal son of the only true and living God. His atoning death on the cross paid the price of redemption for all who come to him in faith. Neither is there salvation in any other way. Since there is no other God, no other savior, 
no other way of salvation, it is imperative that Christians do all they can to confront or comport all men everywhere with the offer of forgiveness and eternal life to all who will receive Christ as their personal Savior. People in our country have exactly the same great need for salvation as those in other lands. And Christians should earnestly try to lead their friends and acquaintances to Christ. At the same time, it should be obvious that they already have many opportunities to hear the gospel. Bibles are readily available in this country. Gospel preaching churches are available, radio broadcasts, Christian literature, Christian friends, etc., etc. Surely literature, surely even, surely no one in this country has even the semblance of an excuse for not being a Christian though admittedly relatively few are really accepted, have accepted Christ. If therefore, if anything therefore, there is much greater need and urgency in foreign missions. For home missions and evangelism through both are essential activities of all Christian churches. 7 reasons why we should say yes to a mission trip. You need to get out. Americans, we tend to, tend to think of ourselves as the center of the world. We are distracted by phones, Facebook pages, Twitter, computer screens. Now, this may surprise you, but you should know that the internet cannot teach you everything you want to know about life. You may be able to Google poverty statistics in India health needs in Mexico, evangelistic initiatives in Russia, but that's not the same as holding a sick person hand in Calcutta. It's not the same as constructing a wheelchair and helping a lady and to be able to move. We don't see Christ on the computer screen. We see it in the faces of the people that we help who can't help themselves. You will see the world differently. In Honduras, people live in small, one-room houses. They sleep on the floor and have never heard of air conditioning. And although the temperatures can be very hot, 90 degrees, they're physically nothing. They have practically nothing and don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet, without hesitation, they will serve you. They will share what they have with you. Their generosity is overwhelming. You may think of them as poor. They are spiritually rich. Missions give you a chance to experience lives of others and discover how and why they live the way they do. You will meet Jesus. Do you sometimes feel you haven't really encountered Christ? Or if you have, do you want to go deeper and experience him in a new way? How about experiencing him in the adoration of a third world where dancing and singing, music and praise is, goes beyond understanding the joy. How about experiencing his love through generosity of the poor? On a mission, our eyes are open to seeing God in the ways that we have never before seen him. Our distractions and pressures in America have left us behind, leaving us open and vulnerable to the crazy love of God. Jesus tells us, tells us, go and make disciples of all nations. Did you know that in Africa, Asia, there's a what's called a tent forty 
window. It's an area between 10 degrees latitude and 40 degrees north of the equator. Think North America, Middle East, Southeast Asia. Two thirds of the world's population live in that area. That's more than 4.4 million, billion, excuse me, billion people. But 90% of those people have never heard the message of the gospel. 90% of those people have never heard the message of the gospel. Never. Not even once. The name of Jesus Christ is, I don't know. Even in places where people have heard the name of Jesus, the re-proclamation of the gospel is desperately needed. We can't ignore the declining activity of the church in Europe. Fifth reason, we will walk in the footsteps of the saints. Jesus himself spent much time with the poor, healing the sick, cleansing lepers, bringing hope to the hopeless. You can bring a friend on a mission trip. How good is that? You can visit a missionary. They'd love to see you. You have no real good reason not to go. I'm sure you can come up with plenty of reasons. You don't want to fundraise. You need an internship for the summer. You never fly with your parents. But really, looking back, these things will become insignificant if you go into missions. What does love look like? It has the hands to help others. It has the feet to hasten to the poor and needy. It has the eyes to see misery and want. It has the ears and the sights and sorrows of men. That is what love looks like. Missionaries have a sense of humor. When they talk to each other, they come up with 10 reasons why you should be a missionary. You get to try new things. Typhoid fever, yellow fever. <laughs> ulcers aren't cool, don't talk about ulcers. You'll meet friends from other countries you didn't know. East Timor. For, I can't even pronounce some of these countries. Fior Islands. Your knowledge of geography will expand. Kids might get a little confused. A little girl loves the story of the ten lepers. You know the one where Jesus healed ten lepers and only one came back to say thank you? She thought, wow, isn't it great that God cares so much about jungle animals? Your driving skills will improve. Did you know you can survive without a rear view mirror, turn signals? Who knew driving 20 miles an hour could be so exhilarating when you don't have a speedometer? You'll be grateful for the little things like cheese. Cheese and stoplights apparently arrive at the same time. So if you, in part of the world without cheese, extra points for you if you're praying for a stoplight. I was going to put bacon, but that's really essential and it's not a little thing. Your bargaining skills will improve. Police won't write you a ticket, but they may take some gummies instead. You'll always be able to use the excuse when asked for directions. I'm not from around here. <laughs> Fashion rules don't apply. <laughs> this is one that's kind of serious, but they talk about all the time. You'll get to report to hundreds of people every month the details about your work, your family, and how you spend their money. 
who needs Dave Ramsey when you have an entire mission board, multiple churches, analyzing your every finance? It, it's accountability on a huge quantities of steroids. You may ask, they may ask you, why so much money? What have you been doing? How are you gonna pay for your kids' education? All of these things missionaries talk to each other about and face real needs. You'll get to exercise the raw joy of cross language barriers, cultural barriers, time zones, comfort zones, simply to invite to follow Jesus. His name is Jesus and at the end of the day, he's worth it. But remember, it's Christ who said and gave us the commission share the gospel the message of his death resurrection that conquered the penalty and the power of sin missionaries do that we may not go into the missions ourselves but they need our support there are average americans that go to on missions truck drivers who respond to an international crisis here i am send me isaiah Often God sends a missionary to a particular people, like Paul went to the Gentiles, or Peter to the Jews. Christians, Christian missionaries are our voice around the world, showing God's love for every individual. If they don't hear that word, if they don't have the example, can they be saved? The gospel says, no, the only way is through Jesus Christ. We need to support our missionaries. We need to go on mission trips if you can. Uh, when missions go, they are in obedience to God. What greater call can one answer than to obey God and his commandment to reach out to all people and convert all people to his life? his way of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. Now with the children.